brain alpha helix, one of the most important receptors in all of biology, from hormones to neurotransmitters to embryogenesis, trans the seven transmembrane alpha helix is involved in that. So just like everything else, let's just start off talking about what happens when the ligand binds to its receptor. One note I wanted to make is that the ligand uh, in this context is usually a hormone, uh, and, but usually something that is soluble in water. It's a soluble protein hormone like epinephrine. That's a soluble protein hormone. The receptor has a pretty unique structure of it. If I were to kind of just, I guess I'll draw it to the best of my ability, which is just that seven transmembrane alpha helix. It has, if I were to draw this as my cytoplasmic cell membrane, there are a lot of better pictures out there on the internet. But anyways, this is what it looks like. And unlike with most other receptors that we've talked about, I guess in this point, we've always talked about, you know, the N-terminus and the C-terminus interactions and things like that. This is more or less what makes this, I guess, the point of action here is the cytoplasmic loops. I'm going to really kind of drag those out here. So when the ligand in this context is usually a soluble protein binds to the receptor, this is going to cause a series of conformational changes that's going to have changes in those cytoplasmic loops, which are going to have pretty drastic uh, effects on what's going on inside the cell. So this is going to cause a conformational change, which results in this context, and, and I'll use this just to reiterate that I'm talking about the beta adrenergenic receptor. Epinephrine or norepinephrine would be binding to this uh, seven transmembrane alpha helix causing conformational changes, which is going to activate G protein or GTP binding protein. All right, so this is conformational change that's going to activate GTP binding protein, as I've illustrated here, interacting with the green uh, part of our cytoplasmic loops because that's what resulted from the conformational change of our soluble ligand. All right, so one of the things that I probably didn't mention, um, well, I mean, I did mention it, but I didn't really stress it, is that this receptor ligand complex is like a bowl, if you could imagine it, and um, 360 degrees of it. So the receptor ligand complex, or really just the activated uh, transmembrane alpha helixes, is going to be activating many different G proteins all at once. It's not just like a one protein activation thing here. This is happening in a lot of them. So for the G protein, or otherwise known as GTP binding protein, um, it has an active form and then it has an inactive form. For the inactive form, this is obviously the form that exists when it's just normally associated with the receptor, uh, in this context, the 7 transmembrane alpha helix receptor, without the presence of a ligand. So in the inactive form, it's a heterotrimer protein, which hopefully you can see by my really bad drawing over here of it as a heterotrimer. And there's really three parts of this heterotrimer. There's an alpha, a beta, and a gamma. I'll explain to you why I drew them out in this order uh, in a second. So for the alpha subunit, and this is the one that's going to be bound to, and so if it's an inactive, it's going to be bound to something known as GDP. Now, both the alpha and the gamma subunits are covalently attached to the membrane, but they're actually attached to the fatty acid tails of the membrane themselves. So they're covalently attached to the fatty acid tails, and remember when we talked about our definitions of integral versus peripheral proteins. For the beta uh, subunit, that really doesn't do a whole lot except acting as a mediator between the alpha and gamma. Uh, and assuming its binding does contribute to the overall stability of the molecule, but the book doesn't really talk too much about uh, the beta subunit of it. I assume it's not, for the purposes of this discussion, really relevant. So once it, it undergoes this conformational change here, which is going to cause it to differentiate into the active form, and the active form is going to do, or really just two things are going to happen. It's going to lose things, and it's going to gain things. So what are the two things that it's going to lose? Well, it's going to lose lose its GDP, uh, and this is going to happen through its own series of conformational changes. There's no need for any type of a nucleotide exchange factor, and it's going to gain, uh, as you can imagine, GTP. Those are the main things that we want to talk about, but at the, at the same time, we're going to have some dissociation between the alpha is going to kind of branch off and do his own thing and become a catalytically active form, and then the gamma and beta are going to dissociate away. So it loses the beta and gamma, and it's also going to lose its GDP. I guess just for, for drawing pictures, GDP is, is leaving it away, and um, it's also going to have a loss of its two little subunits, and we're just going to have the alpha subunit there. And if you're really interested in the specific details of the mechanism, it's when this receptor ligand interaction happens that this conformational change is going to cause the G protein to really let go and to, to leave, release its GDP. 
And then the binding of GTP causes a conformational change that results in the loss of the beta gamma subunit. So I guess if we were to kind of just drag down uh, through very bad diagram or very bad drawings where we're at in this, so we have just the G alpha subunit here. And on one side of it, we have GTP bound. And on the other side of it, we have another side of or site for activity where the beta and gamma subunit used to be. So I guess the point that I'm making is it's not that the GTP binds where the beta gamma was, the GTP binds where the GDP was. I feel like I'm just getting lost in my own words. A lot of, a lot of uh, mixing and jumbling here taking place. So we have GTP bound to gamma alpha, or sorry, G alpha subunit. So for our G alpha GTP, and this is a really important phenomenon because this right here is a very, very bad GTPase enzyme. What GTPases do, well, they convert GTP to hydrolyze the bond of that third phosphorus there to GDP. And this reaction here is really, really slow. Um, these are not very efficient enzymes if you think about it, but it's good that it's slow because once this cleavage happens, everything gets reset. So essentially, the GTPase uh, activity of the uh, G protein alpha subunit, gosh, I'm getting so crazy with my words here, but this is a timer, right? So once this happens, the clock starts to get punched and however long it takes for this enzyme to catalyze this reaction, that's how long this enzyme cascade of the signal transduction pathway is going to be taking place. So it's very slow and this plays a huge role or one of the very early points of signal termination. And the other thing that GTP bound G, T, G alpha subunit does, or I used to think of it as just G alpha, or the alpha subunit of the G protein, is that this plays a huge role in activating adenylate cyclate. Tired, so my handwriting is getting pretty darn bad, but that's what it does. So adenylate cyclase, and I don't have room to fit it down here, but I'll talk about it over here in my next slide. I'll do it in blue, I guess. So if we were to just imagine this being one long membrane here, uh, adenylate cyclase is a integral membrane protein, right? But it's if it ends in A's, you know that it's an enzyme. And so how I drew over here with there being that site where G alpha subunit had its beta gamma subunit, well, this is gonna be the site that's going to bind to, I'm just gonna draw it as A, DN, this is going to be a site that binds to ADN, right? And so this is adenylate cyclase. I have my G alpha subunit coming in and binding to that. That's going to activate adenylate cyclase, which is going to be converting cyclic AM or converting ATP to cyclic AMP. So attached to this G alpha is GTP, and however long that GTP is in place, that's how long the G subunit alpha protein is going to be activating adenylate cyclase. What does adenylate cyclase do? Well, we have ATP going in, going in, and then coming out, we have cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And this right here is really important because this is a second messenger, which is also going to provide us with a site of amplification, right? So it's an integral protein, and it's going from ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP itself is, uh, exists as a second messenger. And the reason why I'm stressing that its identity is as that of a second messenger is that this is one of the many sites where we can have really profuse amplification happening. We're going to be making a lot of these bad boys. And the role that it acts upon as a, as a second messenger is to activate protein kinase A, or PKA for short. So I'm going to try to my really hardest to fit this whole thing in here, but protein kinase A um, is a very unique type of a structure. It is a totally so uh, soluble protein, so we're not we're done with dealing with the the, uh, the membrane at this point. And it has an active form and an inactive form. So in the inactive form, there are two regulatory chains to it, and then there's also two catalytic chains to it. So in the inactive form, we have the two regulatory chains are actually bound to the catalytic active site and therefore the catalytic chains can't catalyze the reactions. So it's bound to the active site of the two catalytic domains. Now we're really running out of room here, but in the active form, what has happened is we have had cyclic AMP has bound to has bound to its subunits on the two regulatory domains. The two regulatory domains are under are going to undergo a conformational change, which is going to ultimately have a release of the two catalytic domains. And the two catalytically active domains are going to do just that. If they're a kinase enzyme, 
I don't know if you how much education you're at or where you're at in this course, but kinase enzymes are enzymes that are involved in the transfer of phosphates, gr phosphate groups, usually to a protein, but not always. So in this context, we're going to have phosphorylation. As long as we have this active form here, we're going to have phosphorylation at both, in this context, serine and threonine amino acid residues. Usually the hydroxylated groups make good sites for phosphorylation. So this is getting kind of ugly and kind of messy. So let's see if we can't draw some really crude pictures of this. So there's one regulatory domain here, and then there's another regulatory domain here. And I'm not going to draw this superbly... Uh, I guess specific here, but if you can imagine that regulatory domain occupying the active site of the catalytic domains, and then whenever we have cyclic AMP binding, when cyclic AMP binds, this is going to cause a conformational changes, which is going to enable the release of the catalytic subunits. C's are both going to be released, right? And they're able to go out and they're able to do all the phosphorylated things that they need to do in their free form. So the question is, well, hey, what causes this cyclic AMP to be a site of termination, right? And the way that we do this is we use an enzyme known as CAMP phosphodiesterase. So for termination of this process, he's here, we want to have an enzyme that's going to remove the cyclic AMP that's ultimately going to result in the reverse of this reaction, right? So this is known as CAMP phosphodiesterase which we're really running out of room for this, but what CAMP phosphodiesterase does it is it takes cyclic AMP and it goes ahead and converts that to just regular old adenosine monophosphate and that conformational change here is going to make it essentially the reaction goes in reverse so once we have if I were to draw it and I'm gonna draw it in gold here the action of camp phosphodiesterase coming in and cleaving this bond here and it resorting, resorting it back to adenosine monophosphate then we go ahead and are restored right back to the regular inactive state with those R sites binding to the active sites of the two catalytic chains. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so I did not have room to talk about protein kinase A in much detail on that last slide, aside from giving details of the structure of it and mechanism of it, so much as the function of it. So it can it function in this context with protein kinase A. Uh, in case you don't remember, we're going to have phosphorylation happening on serine amino acids, and then threonine amino acids. And those are very selective sites for this. So this can do multiple things, but usually in the context of controlling uh, cellular metabolisms and me metabolic processes. And so it plays a role in both activation and in inhibition. Uh, anything that has to do with, in, in this context of the beta adrenergenic receptor, we're going to start breaking down glycogen into the free form of glucose. We're going to start utilizing glucose. A lot of things happen. And this is what kind of drives people crazy is that at this point, they can't really, or they don't really know, at least in what we're talking about in this class, the long-term effects and the downstream effects of activation of protein kinase A because there's so many things that it plays a role in.